Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we're doing our scheduled webinar on building and construction. Martin Pea, Lance Luke. Our topic is construction defect litigation cases. And it would help if I turn on my light here. Forgot all about that. Uh, ah, there's your, your hands. Yeah, I was in the dark. I felt like I was like hiding in the dark. So anyway, we did a uh, kind of a pop-up webinar on the Lahaina Maui uh, yesterday, and we got like people all over the U.S., some from around the world, all interested in the topic. Uh, if you're interested in watching that, you can go to our, well, my Facebook page uh, or my LinkedIn page. And Martin, I don't know, is that video up on our website yet? Oh, we don't know. Anyway, uh, we'll we'll check that out. And let me go through some slides here. Okay, this webinar is presented by Construction Management Inspection, which is a Hawaii-based construction management company that uh, I own. And that's probably the only commercial I'm gonna give. Well, there might be one at the end, we'll see. So let's get right into construction defect litigation cases. I gave a previous webinar on construction defects and talked about uh, what defects are and that kind of thing. So this is like a expansion of that original webinar. By the way, if you missed that webinar, you can catch it on our website I'll give you the information on the website uh, link uh, at, at the end. So we're gonna talk about construction defect litigation cases, not just construction defects. So the idea is what happens if you're building a house or a commercial building and there's problems with the construction? How do you know that it's actually a, a defect and what do you actually do about it? So the main causes of construction defects, there's three main causes. One is a design error. Two is a building material issue. Could be a defective building material, like you uh, buy a piece of lumber and you bring it to the job site and then you find out that it's warped and you really can't use it. So that's a building material defect. And the other one, the last one is workmanship issue or uh, labor. So, you know, the terminology in construction is material and labor, all right? So material is the building material, the labor is the workmanship issue. So. Don't get those uh, two things confused. So those are the three main causes of construction defects. There could be other causes, uh, but those are the main ones. And it, as you can see in the photo, uh, what happened here? You know, they were renovating the house and the roof started leaking, which is not a good thing, right? So what's the most common conditions discovered uh, in, in buildings. One of the most common is a roofing problem. And the roof may not have been installed correctly. And most times that's probably what the problem is. Sometimes the material is defective and it doesn't last as long as it should. And that could be a problem too. But you're gonna need to know the difference between whether it's a material issue or whether it's a workmanship issue. Sometimes contractors may tell you, oh, it's not our fault. We installed it according to plans and specs, but uh, the material may, may be bad. For instance, I had an issue with uh, paint. The uh, paint color looked like it was fading and all that. And the contractor said, uh, something must be wrong with the paint. Come to find out, the contractor did not use enough paint. 
so it was really thin. The mill thickness was not as specified. But in another situation of mine, uh, we had the paint tested and it was found to be defective. There was not enough color in the mix and somehow it just faded out too fast. So not every single instance, it's the contractor's fault regarding the workmanship issue. Okay? If it's a general contractor, they're responsible for both the workmanship and the material anyway. But um, when the labor warranty is over and you have a longer material warranty, uh, therein lies the situation where now you can't really go to the contractor. You have the recourse because the warranty is over on the workmanship side. So you're going to have to contact the material manufacturer or whatever place that you bought the material from or um, go straight to the manufacturer, usually the manufacturers on the mainland. If the manufacturer's in Hong Kong, forget it, good luck. So here we have an image of a roof that some of the concrete that was used is, doesn't look that well, uh, well constructed. And then uh, you have a situation where there's a <clears throat> pipe. And this, this one is like a older pipe that was lined and the lining had failed. So when we talk about construction defects, it doesn't have to be brand new construction. It could be an older building that's remodeled or uh, a pipe, drain pipe that gets uh, lined or fixed in some way without having to remove the entire pipe. So that still could be defective. So it doesn't have to be a brand new uh, building component, okay? Uh, in high-rise buildings, the most common defect is water infiltration. And uh, the, the exterior around the building is considered uh, the exterior wall, and it's called the building envelope. And a lot of times, water infiltration in the building envelope. The building envelope could consist of the roof, the sides of the building, and uh, other assorted areas. Okay, so just imagine a building and you take a envelope, they would ma mail a letter and you cover that building with that envelope. If there's any seams in the envelope, uh, after a rain and water can get in, then that's not a good thing. So most of the claims on new construction of high-rise buildings are water infiltration uh, coming from the exterior of the building. So when, let's talk about like the, the types of, of buildings that could have defects. A single family house could have a defect, right? As you know, um, in addition to single family houses, duplexes, apartment buildings and stuff, but the single family homes could have defects, as you know, and as well as other types of property. So single family homes could be problematic with uh, some defects. Townhouses are multifamily or low rise buildings. And it doesn't matter what type of material is used. Because some in the past, when I used to give seminars on construction defects, people asked, um, is one material better than the other as far as defects? And I say, well, not really. And somebody says, well, wouldn't a concrete building, a building uh, like a multifamily building made out of concrete be less having any defects as compared to a wood frame building? And I say, not necessarily. It depends on the contractor because although concrete is a more solid material than a wood frame structure. If the contractor didn't mix the concrete properly or didn't space the rebar like they should, or 
they didn't paint properly or waterproof and water got in. Now you have concrete spalling within the first, you know, five to six years. And then compare it to the wood frame building that was properly painted and there's no defect. So it really doesn't matter what type of material is, what was used. The key to it is whether they followed the plans and specs. And the other key is the repair and maintenance. A lot of condo buildings built in the 60s, 70s and 80s, uh, they show lack of maintenance and that's why they're kind of falling apart. And that may not necessarily be due to uh, building material compared with, well, what is the cause? Well, the cause is the people didn't maintain the property. And that's why it's starting to fall apart. Case in point, remember that Florida building collapse that happened several years ago? That, that was due to lack of maintenance, okay? But it could also be due to a poor design or poor construction. But after all this time, I, in my opinion, if the building was maintained, even though it was not constructed properly, like they say the concrete mix wasn't that well, or uh, they didn't have enough rebar, the building would still be standing, in my opinion, because it wasn't maintained. That was the cause. The water got in, uh, salt water and crack, got a lot of rusted rebar, major spalling uh, to contribute to major structural damage. So that's townhouses, multifamily and low rises. Low rises is maybe one story to seven stories. That's considered a low rise. A high rise is a building from eight stories high. Most people think a high rise is like a 40 story building, but that's not necessarily the case, right? And goes without saying, if the building height is 80 stories, 100 stories, um, that's you know a high rise already, right? But a high rise could be 10 stories too. It's just the difference in the actual definition and terminology. The reason why a low rise is considered from one to seven stories is because for fire purposes, the fire truck can reach up to the seventh story, seventh floor. So they call those low rises. And uh, the fire truck ladder cannot go past seven stories, then they consider that a high rise. Okay, so that's just one definition. High-rise condo buildings. High-rise condo buildings today, if you live in Honolulu or on the island of Oahu or in Hawaii and you ever go to Kaka'ako, that's where they're building all these high-rise condo buildings, four-story buildings. And the type of building that they're being built today, designed and built, is very complex. It could be over a thousand different building components, a thousand. So it goes without saying that the more components that are in a building, the more technical it is and the more maintenance is needed. Okay, Sort of like a car. In the old days, you didn't have these fancy engines that you need to use a computer monitor to see what the problem is. You could open the hood and you, you know, like a Volkswagen, look at it, four cylinders, well, okay, well, we gotta replace the spark plug or change the oil or something, and that's why. Now, in this day and age, everything's so modern, you need uh, computer equipment to diagnose what the problem is, okay? So, same with a high-rise condo building, a new building. And so, what do you think? If there's a thousand different components in a high-rise building, how much more defects could there be in the building as opposed to you building a single family house and you have 80 different building components or, or less than that? So big difference, right? So keep, keep that in mind when you're thinking about the topic of construction defects. Now, what does all this have to do with the topic, which is construction defect litigation. How are defect litigate, litigation cases resolved? Okay, but before I go into that, I offered some case studies 
And I'm going to be talking about uh, that right now. So case studies, and these are cases that I've actually worked on that ended up in uh, either arbitration, mediation, or construction litigation. So we're talking about single family houses uh, first. So Hawaii Lower Ridge, there was, and these are, you know, multi-million dollar houses, okay? But it also applies to houses that aren't as expensive because they have the same components, right? Sa similar components, you have your foundation, you have your walls, you have your roof, doors, windows, that sort of thing. Inside you have drywall, plumbing, electrical. So any number of those things could be problematic. So on this high rise, I mean, uh, Hawaii Lower Ridge uh, single family house, they installed brand new windows. Now the house wasn't brand new. It was an older house and they remodeled it and they changed all the windows. And then the house was sold. What happened when the buyers moved in, water started leaking from, from the windows into the house, windows and the sliding doors. And it ended up in litigation. And I got called in as an expert for uh, on the buyer's side. So it turned into a real estate litigation case, but it really was part of a construction defect. So Naturally, the buyer sued the seller, and then the seller, in turn, um, brought the contractor in. Okay. And interesting story, the seller side claimed that we had a 100-year hundred, hundred storm, which is a storm that only occurs one time in 100 years. And because of that, the windows leaked. It never leaked before, but only at this event. So that, that was the seller's side. And the buyer's side said, well, it doesn't matter whether it's a 50 year, 100 year, or 1,000 year, the window shouldn't leak at all. So um, it, it got resolved. I'm not sure how it got resolved because um, when I'm an expert witness on cases, I don't normally find out like all I get a call or an email from the attorney saying, oh, uh, you know, the case is settled, but they don't tell me how it was settled. They don't tell me the settlement amount. They don't tell me, you know, what the components are uh, in the settlement, because usually in a settlement, both parties sign a confidentiality agreement, which says we cannot say that one party was guilty we cannot say what the amount of settlement was or what we have to do. Like the settlement could be, oh, we'll give you $100,000, you fix your own windows. Or um, the seller is going to hire a contractor and replace the windows or seal the windows or whatever. Or the contractor is going to come in uh, and fix the windows, plus the seller is going to write a check to the buyer for a hundred thousand dollars something i i don't know all of that stuff right and and they can't really say because they signed an agreement so the parties to the lawsuit including the attorneys have to sign this agreement so therefore me as an expert witness i don't have any information on how the case was resolved sometimes i get it uh but other times i don't Okay, so there's another house in Hawaii Low Ridge, uh, brand new. <clears throat> they spent like four or five million dollars in construction. And what happened was, I got called because the owner said, you know, uh, <clears throat> something's wrong because water is coming in where my windows are, but where my sliding door is. And uh, I said, okay, let, go, let me check it out. So I, I go to the house and every bedroom had a sliding door that goes to a balcony. And right around the sliding door on the inside of the house, the carpet was like all wet and stained and everything. And I'm like, this is really odd. Um, you know, so I told the guy, your sliding doors are leaking. And he says, wow, it's not supposed to be like that. 
So then I opened the door to go out and then I realized that on every single bedroom, the height of that balcony was higher than the inside of the house, right? So you have a higher elevation on your balcony and inside the house in the bedroom, it was lower by uh, an inch. And I said, you know what? This is backwards. It's so obvious that when it rains, the water is going to flow downwards, right? And unfortunately, downwards is inside your house. So it became a problem because I said, you know what? The, the architect, both the architect and the contractor is responsible. The architect shouldn't have designed it that way. So I said, contact the architect. And then he, he tells me, oh, this is the name of the architect. And then said, well, what about your contractor? Then he gives me the same name. And I go, uh, how, can it, how can it be like the same name? And he said, oh, it was uh, a design build contract. So design build contract is, is one entity. The designer, the architect is the same entity as a contractor. In some cases, it's okay, but in some situations, it's not. And in, in this situation, it, it wasn't okay because you only have one guy to sue instead of two, right? So that's a single family house. There was another house, older house at Kailua, where they re-roofed and they put a new roof on and it started leaking. So that's a defect, right? And then... Um, there was a house, a Cocoa Head area, brand new, 700,000, okay? And about within a year, there were cracks in the uh, garage slab, which would be to be expected, but there were cracks inside the rooms. And the guy called me up and said, I got cracks on my walls. I said, well, yeah, drywall is common for cracking especially if there's settlement and he goes oh no my house is made out of block tile and I said what do you mean your whole house and he goes yeah instead of drywall I wanted a CMU construction and he goes um it's so bad that from when you're inside the house you can see the outside and I I said to myself okay uh you know the guy's like exaggerating but sure enough, when I went to his house, I could actually, the crack was so big, the joint crack between the two block tiles, I could see outside. I could look at the neighbor watering his yard. That's how bad it was. So, so I said, the problem is the soil is moving. So did you get like a soil report or anybody take soil samples? And he goes, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know anything about construction. So I asked the attorney and what happened was the attorney gave me all this paperwork and I read it and the contractor told the homeowner, because there was an old house here before, we don't need to do any soil testing because it's obvious that um, you know, the house is still standing. So what they did was they knocked down the house and they built a brand new one. And it's logical, right? But then when you think about it, as I went further and looked at the architectural plans and all that, oh, wait a minute. The old house was like 800 square feet and, and made out of wood frame, single wall construction, okay? You're gonna knock that house down and you're gonna build a 2,500 square foot house on a concrete slab, right? With CMU blocks. Already, common sense would tell you that that newer house, the weight of the newer house is going to be a lot heavier than the older house, right? So how can you say, oh, because the old house is there already, we don't have to do any soil testing. And then further to that, the subcontractor that was hired to do grading told the, the general contractor, hey, you know, the soil <clears throat> doesn't look that good. And the general contractor told him, um, that's okay. We're not getting paid to remove soil or anything. So just keep, keep building. So all that came out 
So was the general contractor guilty? Yes, he was. Was a was an architect and engineer guilty? Yes, because they should have known better. Okay, so that's another issue. Um, and then my latest case was a house in Kailua where it was renovated. They wanted to uh, renovate their family room, and it became a claim because the contractor started designing that area himself because he couldn't get a hold of the architect or engineer. Now, this is a case that I actually represented a contractor rather than a home homeowner. Most of the cases I work on as an expert witness that are uh, defect litigation cases, I represent the homeowner, not the contractor. But uh, in some cases, I represent the contractor. So I'm not only one person against the contractor all the time. So you kind of have to have a mix. Otherwise, you're going to go, hey, this guy naturally goes against contractors all the time. So he's biased already, right? So they can't say that about me because I represent both homeowners and contractors. Now, let's talk about um, other types of buildings. So a townhouse building, I worked on, had uh, roofing done, $1 million, and they did the first six roofs and it was wrong. And there was a settlement. And why was it wrong? Because they used nails that were too short. And why is it a problem? Because if you have a hurricane and you have nails that are too short, your uh, shingles gonna start blowing off the roof. Okay, and then another situation, they installed uh, photovoltaic PV panels on the roof and then when the first rain hit, there was leaks. Okay, so that's actually ongoing now. Um, I'm still working on the island of uh, Kauai. I had a townhouse, brand new project that they had construction defects and then uh, a condominium project, same thing. So this is out at the uh, Hoi Pu, yeah. And then in um, another recent case, which I'm still working on, uh, is in Kona. And it's older buildings that needed spalling repair work. And uh, the association claims that the contractor didn't do a good job. And on this case, I represent the contractor. The case is not settled yet, so that's still ongoing. Um, I can't mention any names of the condos because it's still ongoing but I can name the next one, the next high rise condo, the name is Ko'olani. And I was the lead uh, construction defect expert on that case. And when I did my punch list inspection, this was like a uh, year two after the condo was built, two and a half to three years, I discovered I put together spreadsheets with photos and all that. I discovered that when I calculated the cost to correct, it came to about $15 million. So can you imagine a brand new condo building having $15 million worth of repair work at that time? This is not recently, no. They went through arbitration mediation and the settlement was for 12.5 million or something like that. And what kind of things that they have, they had water infiltration, they had, uh, my spreadsheet was super long. Every single item, window leaking, uh, they had like uh, tennis courts where the chain link fencing was all bent because it couldn't withstand high winds, pool tile delaminating, People are swimming in the pool and uh, tiles are falling off the pool wall, you know, things like that. So, and, and then you get into like mechanical electrical stuff. Um, and then you get into noise issues where people in the unit are complaining, oh, you know, I hear like a rattling sound all the time. Oh, okay, well, shouldn't it be like that? Or, you know, my next door neighbor, I can, I can tell you what they have for dinner because I can smell it. It comes through my exhaust vent in my kitchen. Like, well, wait a minute, that's, 
that's not right. So all these little, little things add up. And then when you're in charge of a big building and determining defects, you have to break it down into categories, okay? So anything that affects mechanical, plumbing, that goes in that category. Anything that affects the building itself, structural, that goes into separate category or electrical, that's electrical. So you have these different lists divided by uh, different sections of a building, okay? The roof is by itself, exterior it's by itself in its own category. So you have to segregate it because when you're settling with um, the general contractor, you're gonna have a meeting with only the mechanical engineer, mechanical contractors and so forth. Uh, we have a meeting to you know, fix the roof. You only involve the roofing subcontractor and the general, and of course the architect. You don't have like a huge meeting with all these people because most of the time it doesn't apply like the pool tile guy. Why does he have to listen to us talking about the air conditioning problem? So, you know, the initial meeting, you could have 30 people in, in on the meeting, and then you have separate breakout sessions, right? And then uh, each contractor, subcontractor has their own attorney, and insurance company has their own attorney. And then some of these attorneys are on the mainland. So we're having like a five o'clock conference call. Some attorneys are in New York. It's like, you know, 12 o'clock over there. And we're having a conference call and said, oh yeah, Mr. Attorney, what's your, um, you know, your, your feedback? And then you don't hear anything. And then when you turn up the volume on your speaker phone, you can hear the guy snoring because he fell asleep. So those are just some stories about, uh, you know, construction defect settlement. Now there's one big class action lawsuit that I worked on as a lead expert and it involved a property in Eva called Ocean Point. The developer was Haseko. And the claim was defective uh, hurricane ties and anchor bolts. And if you don't know what those are, those are building components made out of metal that are used to secure the house. So in the event of a hurricane or strong winds, the house doesn't get blown away or the roof doesn't get blown off. So you have hurricane ties or hurricane straps which connect the, the roof to the house wall. If your house is two stories, it's the roof to the second story wall. And then you have another uh, series of straps to connect the first floor to the second floor. And then from the house wall to connect to your foundation, you have anchor bolts, okay? So there was a claim of defective anchor bolts and hurricane ties or hurricane straps and involved like thousands of homes, including townhouses, so single family homes, townhouses. Um, I had to fly to uh, LA, Beverly Hills. That's where the lead attorney's office is to have a meeting with them over there. And, and the cases in Hawaii, because that law firm only handled class action lawsuits. So it was very interesting. I was not involved in the repair side of it. I was only involved in the litigation side. Uh, and then there was uh, continuing litigation regarding uh, plumbing pipes, which I was not involved in as an expert. I was only involved in the uh, hurricane tie thing. By the way, the Technical term for hurricane ties is continuous load paths. And that's the terminology for uh, the hurricane tie connection or straps. Okay. So that was a, a pretty big case. I think that was the biggest class action construction defect law lawsuit uh, in Hawaii. I haven't heard of any other uh, bigger ones than that. There could be, but I'm not. Uh, really aware of that. So how cases are involved, cases are involved when you get the parties together and one side has to prove. So the burden of proof is on the person or the entity who's making the complaint. So 
if if I'm working for a condo building or a homeowner, let's talk about uh, a single family homeowner to make it more simple. Okay, the burden of proof is on the homeowner to tell the contractor um, there's defects in in this house and uh, I need you to to fix it. Now, if the contractor says no, there isn't a defect, and the homeowner says, uh, I don't agree with you, and uh, a complaint's filed, okay, a legal court complaint, the homeowner cannot be his or her own expert witness. You know why? Because that person or persons are not skilled or trained or experienced in construction. Now, they can say, I'm a homeowner and a contractor didn't do this or didn't do that. But when it comes to burden of proof, and that's why everyone has to hire experts in, in whatever field they're in. So this is construction. So you hire a construction expert because that expert is the one that's going to say, I inspected the house and this is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because it doesn't follow manufacturer specifications. It fell apart or Here's a section of the building code that says you have to do this. Or here's a reference on the plans. The contractor failed to, to do this that the plan shows, and therefore that's what caused the defect. Okay? The homeowner can't do that because he's not qualified. So you have to be uh, qualified in court as an expert witness to, to testify on, on these things. So I, I get asked a lot of times, well, Lance, why do I have to hire you? I already know that the roof's not put on correctly. Um, you know, I need to save money. And I says, I didn't, I didn't make up the rules. The rules are there. If you're gonna hire an expert, it has to be an expert skilled in testifying on construction matters. So what what's your background? Oh, I I, I work at the post office. Oh, do you know anything about construction? Uh, no, not really. Okay, well, therefore, you're not a qualified expert. Plus that you can't be an expert witness on your own case. It has to be an independent third party. And although I would represent you, I have to tell the truth. I can't say, oh, because you hired me and you're paying me, I'm going to twist the facts so that you look good and the contract is wrong. That's not how it goes, right? The, the whole idea of an expert is to investigate and and give the facts and tell the truth not to try the case or say yeah the contractor's guilty because he did this and that or he didn't do this and that that's for the court or the arbitrator or mediator that's not for the expert okay so how cases are involved the burden of proof as much as you can prove go to your contract and say look according to this contract the con the contract is required to put a new roof on it doesn't say put a roof on and uh, it can leak and it'll be okay, right? So that's why contracts got to be written correctly and it cannot be no one or two pager, right? It has to have a lot, of, a lot more detail. So homeowners, if you're out there um, watching and listening, if you're dealing with a contractor, and it's $50,000 or more. And I've seen, and I talked to homeowners who signed con contracts for 650,000, 850,000, 1.2 million, 1.5 million. And they never hired a construction consultant. They never hired somebody to review their contract, right? And I'm like, look, you're paying, you, you agreed to pay uh, $1.5 million. You never bothered to get an attorney uh, for like $500 or $1,000 or $1,500 to review your contract? And then what about, um, you're spending all this money, what about hiring a third-party inspector who go to the house once a month and inspect and make sure everything's okay? Oh, oh we didn't want to spend the extra money. Yeah, but look now, you know, it's costing you a lot more money. It's costing you even more. If you're going to litigate against the contractor, you end up spending thousands of dollars in attorney's fees. So my point is prevention is the key. If you can prevent all these things from happening up front, better for you, right? You spend a little more money, but you have peace of mind.
I could tell you a lot of war stories of people who never bothered to check their contract or follow up with the contractor or didn't visit the house while it was going under construction. And when the contractor says, oh, um, your house is done yet. And then the lady walks, the lady calls me and says, oh, um, can I hire you to do a punchless inspection? The house is finished. I just want to know what's going on, whether the contractor did a good job, job or not. I said, okay, fine. So I, <laughs> I meet the lady and she walks into her kitchen and she says, huh? I didn't, uh, I wanted the windows higher. Look, look, take a look. And she goes, stand right over here and look. And I'm standing at the sink looking out and saying, okay, um, so so what? She goes, no, 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 this is not the view I wanted. I can't even see most of the ocean because the window is too low. I wanted to be able to do my dishes and see the entire water out there. I can't because you got all this drywall up uh, the window is too low. It should have been higher. And I'm like, okay, now it's not the time to. And then the contractor's there, and the contractor says, look, look at the plans. We'll measure it and see. I followed exactly what the plans were. So, I mean, it it's too late already when that happens. And then I asked the contractor, oh, by the way, how much is it going to cost to, uh, you know, move this these two windows higher by two feet? And the contractor says, oh, hold on, let me figure this out. And he goes, it'll be $22,000. And the lady says, what? And, and she goes, is that right? I'm getting ripped off. And I said, that sounds about right. Because you know what? He has, to, he has to demolish the interior drywall, the outside stucco, remove the window, reframe, bring in a brand new window, and redo everything all over. And by the way, when he does it, guess what? The stucco is not going to match. The color is not going to match. The inside drywall, it, it can match. But uh, you have problems over here. And the lady goes, I'm not, I'm not paying that. So, you know, that's another story. And I can tell you, I can probably give like a webinar every week of different stories. But that's all in a nutshell. So I think I've talked enough. I want to make sure that I answer whatever questions come up. But before I get to that, uh, let me see. Conclusion from the building expert, hire experts. That's my conclusion. Get an attorney to review your construction contract or get another contractor, your friend, or a third party. Okay. What you missed, we've given a whole bunch of webinars for the past maybe three years or so. You go to our website, uh, you can watch any of the webinars on any topic of your choosing, roofing, uh, painting, uh, asphalt, electrical, plumbing. We got a whole selection there. I'm, I'm actually running out of topics because it was given so many webinars. What's coming up? We got interesting webinars coming up. We probably have some more on the Lahaina Fire. We're going to talk about uh, Aloha, Aloha Stadium. We're going to talk about Red Hill. We're going to talk about uh, the rail. So these things like are not really directly building and construction topics, but it's it's on demand. Basically, people, I I I ask people, what kind of topics do you want me to talk about? And recently, they said Maui Fire, so that's why we gave one. And uh, on the list was talk about the rail, talk about Red Hill, talk about Aloha Stadium. Now, these may be not interesting topics to you, but if it is, tune into our website and sign up. So here's our website, askbuildingexpert.now.site. If you want information, like I said, you can sign up for future webinars. You can watch webinars that we've given already you can actually get free books. We have a couple of free books. We got um, other things to give you. You can also visit our different expert websites. We have some expert websites on different topics like concrete spalling, cast iron drain piping, uh, fire life safety, those kind of things. So. Um, this site, we work on it every single day, adding more and more stuff to it. So it's 
pretty big. So here's the Q&A time. You got questions, I got answers. If you need to get a hold of me, my number is 808-422-2132. Email lancelook at hawaiibuildingexpert.com. Now, I'm not always sitting in my office waiting for my phone to ring. Most of the time I'm on in the field. So if you call or email, I might not get to you right away. Now, if you're watching and you're from Maui, from Lahaina, and you need answers to some questions regarding rebuilding or materials, what to use or how to hire a contractor or whatever, I have a special email address for you guys. And that's lahaina at hawaiibuildingexpert.com. If you use that special email, that goes into a different category for your re response. We, we have a team standing by ready, ready to help. So I'm going to see if Martin is uh, looking at any questions that may have come up, and then uh, I can help answer those. So, Martin, are you ready? Yes, Lance. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. All right. All right. Well, we had some earlier questions that came in that I wanted to share with you. Um, the first one here is, out of the three main causes of construction defects that you mentioned, what is the number one cause and why? Can you repeat that again, please? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Out of the three main causes of construction defects, what is the number one cause and why? The number one cause of construction defects is workmanship issues, labor, human error. So I would say poor workmanship is the number one cause. And based on all the cases that I've worked on, and looking at other cases, not only in Hawaii, but on the mainland, and I have to rank the number one cause out of the three, right? The three being design error, building material failure, failure of, of building material, or a workmanship issue. The number one cause is workmanship, human, human error. And the reason why is uh, it could be untrained workers, it could be workers that are trained, but they're working too fast because they're rushing. The developers saying, hurry up, finish the building. I, I got to close on my units. I got to sell. I got to get my money out, right? So they're pushing, pushing. And, and everyone knows it's human nature. If you're rushing, you're, there's a tendency to maybe not, go to, not do a as good of a job as you would have if you weren't rushing, if you took your time. Hmm. So those are the contributing factors to what's happening with the workmanship issue. But I, I think because of the shortage of labor workers today, I think there's a, a definite um, relationship between the work product, the workmanship issue in construction. You don't have all journeymen working, you know, on your project. You have a lot of um, labor workers and they get promoted really fast. Like on a job site of mine, you know, for weeks, I saw this one guy and he was a cleanup guy. He would go to the job site, pick up excess lumber, scrap lumber, sweep up and all that, throw it in the trash bin. And then one week I saw him with a tool belt and I said, hey, um, so what, you're, you're now a, a labor worker? What happened? I thought you're the cleanup guy. Oh no, I got promoted. I said, oh, have you ever taken any um, classes or anything? He said, no, on the job training. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, I don't want that guy working on my house. So, and it's not his fault. He, he, he didn't have time to go take the apprentice classes and stuff like that. So, I mean, anytime there's a shortage of labor, the work product goes down. It's just what, what it is and what happens. Yeah. So just 
keep an eye out. In fact, those of you who are having a contractor build or remodel your house, ask the question. And it, it's either your house or working at a condo building, ask the question. You talk to the contractor, he's the owner or he's the sales guy, right? Really nice. But he's not the guy that's going to be pounding the nail and, and cutting drywall and all that. You want to know who the crew is too, right? Because once you sign the contract and the guy takes your money and now different guys are at the site, you, you got to make sure you're going to get your money's worth. Yeah. So we got any other interesting questions? Your friends, good answer. Yeah, good answer. Um, yeah, the next one that came in is, um, how does the construction defect litigation benefit property owners and those that buy in new condo buildings? Well, the benefit, the benefit to that is they get their, they get their house or building fixed up and they don't have to live with all the defects anymore. And basically they get their money's worth. So for instance, somebody who's buying a, a condo in Waikiki, in, uh, Waikiki or, or Kaka'ako, probably Kaka'ako and they're spending $1.5 million. If the building has defects, guess what? Are they getting their $1.5 million? Are they getting their money's worth? No, they're not because what if there's $500,000 worth of defects, right? So they're overpaying. So if they didn't go after the developer and contractor, they're, they're not getting what they bargained for, right? Same way in a single family house. If you're paying a contractor X amount of dollars and you have all these defects and all that, the contractor runs away, he doesn't come back or he makes excuses and and this is pretty typical. The contractor knows that homeowners, most homeowners are not contractors. They're not into construction. So they're going to say, oh, it's supposed to be like that. Or, um, or don't worry when, you know, all that white stuff on, on your roof shingles, when it rains, the, the, the rain water will um, clean your shingles. Or, well, the reason why the door is not in the right place is because I couldn't fit it because you got this beam in the way or whatever reason to give. But as a homeowner, do you know if that's true or not? Are you gonna accept what the contractor tells you? I'm not saying that all contractors are giving you a bunch of BS. I'm just saying um, you can trust, but verify, okay? You can listen to the contractor and say, okay, I understand what you're saying, but I'm gonna get, a third party, I'm gonna get somebody to go check. Sometimes, well, more than sometimes, I get called by a homeowner and they said, well, we want you to help us because we think we're getting a runaround. And so there's a list. I said, what's your list? Okay, so we go down the list. What did the contractor say about this? Oh, he said, that's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, what about this one? Oh, he said the reason why he couldn't do it because this stuff was in the way. What about this item? So, and then I give my opinion. And a lot of times my opinion is not the same as what the contractor's opinion is. That's why you need somebody to help you, a third party person, okay? So just be aware of that. You need somebody on your side if it's not going smoothly. Thank you, Lance, and I agree with you. You've been very helpful in making sure I get the jobs done right. So that's that, it's so true. And you really got to monitor. I, I even found I I like to be on site to kind of see when renovations and things are happening. So I kind of really understand what they're doing. So that's that's my personal thing too. But anyway, well, that's guys, good. I'm I'm glad I was able to help you. I actually like um, went over to your house to eat lunch rather than look at your construction, <laughs> but. I didn't want to tell you that earlier. Nah, no problem. You're all you're always helpful. Uh, the the other questions coming in here, we get a couple more. Is um, what types of properties do you see the most defects in? Okay, so um, we're talking about the types of property: residential, commercial, uh, retail, industrial. I would say the type of property mostly is residential. The most claims are in the residential area as opposed to like an office building or shopping center uh, or industrial. 
Okay, now that's not to say that they don't have their own defect. They do, but and it could be because most of the buildings being built today are residential, right? We have a shortage of housing, so um, you know if if you have a thousand houses versus a hundred commercial buildings, the percentages are that there's going to be more houses, more residential that have defects, right? Uh, that's not to say that the contractors are are doing a sloppy job residential and they're doing a good job building commercial because it depends on the contractors. I've I've inspected houses, multi-billion dollar houses that had almost zero defects because the contractor was a good contractor. And I've inspected a house where they paid $450,000 for a new house and they had 250 problems. And some of them were, were major. And when the homeowner said, you know, I used my life savings to, to have the house built, out of all the items on the list, and granted, some of them were minor, how much would it cost to like fix all these things? And I said, uh, about 150,000. And, and the lady like didn't, didn't believe me. So that's a good example of you need somebody to be on your side helping. You can't do it alone. Construction is, if you think construction is easy, it's not, okay? There's too many components, too many moving parts. There's too much chance that things, anything could go wrong at any given time. So that's why you need to be very careful. In fact, the cost of construction is so high now that you know, it pays to get somebody to help you. In the past, like 20, 30 years ago, when construction was a lot cheaper, it didn't matter because it was cheap, but now it's not cheap. And when the cost of a mortgage loan is 7.5% or something like that, and you're paying money for a construction loan, you want to be sure you get your money's worth, right? So that's my, uh, my opinion. Any other uh, comments or questions? Uh, this is more of a kind of a general question here. Let me let me ask it. It says, "How are the defects corrected, and can you provide a specific protocol to follow?" Oh, actually, that's a that's a very good question because people aren't aware. Like, let's say you have a house, and then you notice, hey, you know, some of the shingles aren't roofing shingles aren't like installed correctly. And the contractor may say, oh, yeah, okay, no problem. We'll go back and fix it. Okay? Or something else is wrong. Your door doesn't close or whatever. If it's minor, fine. But if it's not, okay, like on uh, high-rise building or single-family houses that I work on, here's the protocol. Find out what happened. How did this situation become prevalent? Was it poor workmanship? Was it poor design, right? Was the material bad? And then after that, you want the contractor to give you the repair protocol. Mr. Contractor, how are you gonna fix the shingles? How are you gonna fix the, the window here? I, I, and have it in writing, I, wanna, I want that. And then if, it, if it's a bigger item, you get the manufacturer to, to come in and say and give the specs on how this is going to be corrected. Now, for the most part, you're talking small money, but if it's big ticket item, like for a condominium building, I worked on, you know, waterproofing of the parking deck. And they spent 400,000 and there's failure of the waterproofing. I don't tell the contractor, you know what, just go back and fix it. I tell them, bring your manufacturer's rep. I want to know what the problem is, right? And I want that rep to write repair spec protocol, and I want the contractor to follow it. Of course, I already know the answers, but I'm pushing it because I want the contractor to be responsible. So 
don't just blindly let the contractor go and fix stuff. You want the repair protocol, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's the caveat to you. There's also a National Association of Home Builders standards. If you reference those standards in your contract, the contract contractor must follow these standards, then you're protected because if he deviates from that, then you know you you can require him to come back. Also make sure. It's a clause that the contractor is going to follow the plans and specs and uh, all the work will be following the current building code, the applicable building code at the time. You know, these are all protections for you. I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book now, how to work with a contractor. So when I get it uh, finished, I'll let you guys know and you can have more information. So, Martin, we have anything else? I know it's like uh, end of the hour. Yeah, no, we uh, we don't have any more, but they're all were good questions. Yeah. So, yeah, good. Thank you. Okay, so on behalf of uh, Martin, Pea, myself, Lance Luke, Ask the Building Expert series, we thank you for joining us. And if you're watching the replay, thank you for watching. Um, tune in. We're going to have some upcoming interesting webinars. We may even talk more about the Lahaina fire and other important top of mind issues. So we'll see you at the next webinar. Aloha. Aloha. Signing off. <laughs>